Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1. You are going to listen to the director of a college talking about his school. Listen to the talk and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Many of you already have a reasonably firm idea of the general subject area you wish to study. Others are more open and searching for ideas. Whatever your situation, I hope you find that we have a course that meets your needs. Our firm aim is to be a student-centred institution with a special emphasis on flexibility. This begins with our attitude to access. We judge people on their motivation and commitment to study as much as, if not more than, formal qualifications. This is reflected in the vitality and diversity of our student population. Some of our students come direct from sixth form or college. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Others are coming into higher education after a short or long gap from formal education. Some are seeking a specific set of skills with a particular job or profession in mind. Others are retraining or studying to give their careers a new direction or dimension. Some are learning about the very latest scientific, technological and commercial knowledge. Others are stretching their minds on sensitive environmental, social and cultural issues. Even a casual observation of the mix of our student body indicates that we're close to our aim of being a polytechnic for the whole community. To meet our students' needs, we have 500 academic and a further 500 support staff committed to good quality teaching, high standards and sensitive and sympathetic student care. We have probably the longest experience of understanding and dealing with the differing needs of a diverse student population. I hope you'll find a suitable course at the Polytechnic College if you want to come to the college and we consider you suitable, we'll do our best to find you a place. And when you're here, we'll work hard to make your experience enjoyable, stimulating and educationally rewarding. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. OK, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So, H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future. And the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells's work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, He'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701 in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloa, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloa. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells's work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia, published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care, and interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the healthcare, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and in The Shape of Things to Come, which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the Internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells's main requirements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students discussing a presentation they'll do on an article on working effectively in groups. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Brad, what did you think of the article on group work? Oh, hi, Helen. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good, with helpful pieces of advice on how to make group work effective. I think we were lucky to be given such a straightforward text to present at the Management Skills Seminar. Yeah. Actually, shall we discuss it now? Have you got time? Sure. It's only a 10-minute presentation, so we just need to explain and then give our views on the main points raised in the article. I'll jot down some notes. Right. So, there are three main sections. I suggest we start with listening. Yeah, effective listening in groups, because it's not something that's frequently covered on courses in our field. No, and we should say that in the presentation. Yeah. And also, effective listening's pretty simple, you know. I don't think it's hard to learn. Well, people think it's easy, but in my experience, most of us tend to be very lazy listeners. OK, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do think we should emphasize is the power of the listener's posture, gestures, etc., in making speakers feel respected. Not that you're just waiting for them to finish before jumping in with your own ideas. Uh-huh. OK, right. Uh, the next section is on goal setting. Let's make sure we're clear what the article says on this. Yeah. 
Well, firstly, it says that all group members must be given time to explain their own goals. That's it, yeah. And then, did it say that the whole group should agree on common goals? That's a bit too strong. It's more that everyone's agendas should be equally acceptable. But it does say that goals have to be realistic, you know... Achievable within a particular time? You've got it. That's really what the article's saying. There isn't really any point in having ideals if group members know they won't come to anything within a reasonable period. So, I think a summary covering those points will be enough for that part of the presentation, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Now, the last section is about conflict resolution. Actually, I thought it was the worst part of the article. Me too. I don't think it went into sufficient detail on the issue. Actually, I thought it devoted too much space to it, but that it was all rather boring, you know? It didn't mention some of the more radical theories. Absolutely. I found that really irritating. Right. And also, I think it could have said more about conflict sometimes being healthy in groups. Absolutely. It just mentioned rather glibly about how we should avoid thinking of winners and losers and that quick resolution of conflict is always desirable. Without explaining what these terms mean? Well, it gives quite detailed definitions, but doesn't develop a proper argument. Right. So, for the presentation, I think we just give some definitions and... And then explain what we feel felt were the weaknesses in the article's treatment of conflict resolution. Yeah, good. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, let's think about what we have to prepare for the actual presentation. Well, I suppose we'll use PowerPoint, but I'm hopeless at using it, especially if it has any visuals. I really have to look into doing a course on it because I know I'll need it in the future. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm quite happy using PowerPoint and I'll put it together when everything else is ready. That's a relief. But yes, do that later. OK. Now, I heard the tutor saying we have to include some well-chosen quotations from the article. I'm not sure if we do. I'll email him to find out. No need. I can just have a look at the specs he gave us when he set the task. That'll be quicker. But the tutor definitely said we have to prepare a handout to go with the talk. I'm not really sure how we do that. Sarah did one last year. Who's she? She's doing the same option as me on marketing. I'll ask her advice on what to include. Great. So that just leaves the bibliography at the end. I suppose it'll mainly be articles. Yeah. So we'll just look on the web, and we can leave that till later. But we've been advised against that. Well, we could have a look through some journals in the library. I think we should start by looking through module handbooks. I think that'll give us some good leads. Yeah, you're probably right. So that's all the topics. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Hear an extract from a talk given by a lecturer from management department of a university on the topic, job satisfaction. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Job satisfaction is how happy an individual is with his or her job. Scholars and human resource professionals generally make a distinction between effective job satisfaction and cognitive job satisfaction. Effective job satisfaction is the overall extent of pleasurable emotional feelings individuals have about their jobs and is different from cognitive job satisfaction which is the extent of individual satisfaction with particular facets of their jobs such as pay, pension, arrangements, working hours and numerous other aspects of their jobs. At its most gender level of conceptualization, job satisfaction is simply how content an individual is with his or her job. Effective job satisfaction is usually defined as a one-dimensional subjective construct representing an overall emotional feeling individuals have about their job as a whole. Hence, effective job satisfaction for individuals reflects the degree of pleasure or happiness their job in general induces. Cognitive job satisfaction is usually defined as being a more objective and logical evaluation of various facets of a job. As such, cognitive job satisfaction can be one-dimensional if it comprises evaluation of just one aspect of a job, such as pay or maternity leave, or multidimensional if two or more facets of a job are simultaneously evaluated. Environmental factors one of the most significant aspects of an individual's work in a modern organization concerns the management of communication demands that he or she encounters on the job. Demands can be characterized as a communication load. Individuals in an organization can experience communication overload and communication underload which can affect their level of job satisfaction. Communication overload can occur when an individual receives loads of message in a short period of time which can result in unprocessed information or when an individual faces more complex messages that are more difficult to process. Due to this process, given an individual's style of work and motivation to complete a task, when more inputs exist than outputs, the individual perceives a condition of overload which can be positively or negatively related to job satisfaction. In comparison, communication under load can occur when messages or inputs are sent below the individual's ability to process them. According to the ideas of communication over load and under load, if an individual does not receive enough input on the job or is unsuccessful in processing these inputs, the individual is more likely to become dissatisfied, aggravated and unhappy with their work that leads to a low level of job satisfaction. Superior subordinate in communication Superior subordinate communication is an important influence on job satisfaction in the workplace. The way in which subordinates perceive a superior's behavior can positively or negatively influence job satisfaction. Communication behavior such as facial expression, eye contact, vocal expression and body movement is crucial to the superior subordinate relationship. Nonverbal messages play a central role in interpersonal interactions with respect to impression formation, deception, attraction, social influence and emotional bonding. Individuals who dislike and think negatively about their supervisor are less willing to communicate or have motivation to work Whereas, individuals who like and think positively of their supervisor are more likely to communicate and are satisfied with their job and work environment. A supervisor who uses non-verbal immediacy, friendliness and open communication lines is more likely to receive positive feedback and high job satisfaction from a subordinate. Strategic Employee Recognition Employee recognition is not only about gifts and points. It's about changing the corporate culture in order to meet goals and initiatives and most importantly to connect employees to the company's core values and beliefs. Strategic employee recognition is seen as the most important program not only to improve employee retention and motivation but also 
to positively influence the financial situation. The vast majority of companies want to be innovative, coming up with new products, business models, and better ways of doing things. However, innovation is not so easy to achieve. A CEO cannot just order it and so it will be achieved. You have to carefully manage an organization so that over time innovations will emerge. Individual factors Mood and emotions form the effective element of job satisfaction. Moods tend to be long lasting but often weaker states of uncertain origins while emotions are often more intense short-lived and have a clear object or cause. Positive and negative emotions were also found to be significantly related to overall job satisfaction. It was found that suppression of unpleasant emotions decreases job satisfaction and the amplification of pleasant emotions increases job satisfaction. There are two personality factors related to job satisfaction, alienation and locus of control. Employees who have an internal locus of control and feel less alienated are more likely to experience job satisfaction, job involvement and organizational commitment. The characteristics like high self-esteem, self-efficacy and low neuroticism are also related to job satisfaction. I've got an itch I can't scratch, I'm missing a piece that completes a whole part of me, an open wound scar to see. Everybody come here, gather round, welcome to the freak show, the best in town.